Hey, this is the Level Up Engineering Podcast, where we talk with some of the most successful tech leaders who reveal actionable management insights that help you take your developer team to the next level. This episode was brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications with Angular and Node.js. Check them out at CodingSans.com. Welcome to Level Up Engineering. Hope you're doing well. In each episode, we pick the mind of an experienced leader in the technology industry. I am Carolina Toth, and I will be your host today. Please join me in welcoming today's guest, Camille Fournier. Camille is the author of the 2017 book, The Manager's Path, and she's currently fulfilling the role of the managing director at Two Sigma. Welcome, Camille. Thank you. Happy to be chatting with you. Please tell us a bit more about your background and what you do. Sure. So I've been in tech for a long time. My background is as a software engineer. I have uh, undergraduate and master's degrees in computer science. I worked for Goldman Sachs for a long time as a, an individual contributor, largely there um, with a little bit of like tech lead and uh, small team management. I worked on a bunch of different big sort of distributed systems projects internally there. I also worked on um, the Apache Zookeeper project. When I left Goldman Sachs, I went to a company called Rent the Runway, which is a startup here in the United States that rents women's clothing and accessories. And it's actually extremely, extremely popular, especially here in New York City. And I became the CTO there. Uh, So I was there for about four years and it was a massive learning experience for me going from someone who had only really managed a little bit to being, you know, a manager of managers and an executive and and really learning all those ropes. And so when I left that job, I decided to take some time off and figure out what I wanted to do next. And in that time, I also wrote the book, The Manager's Path, which is my book about all the different kind of levels of engineering leadership focused on management. And uh, now I run a platform engineering team at a financial company here in New York City. Um, And so platform engineering means the sort of software side of infrastructure. So things like distributed compute, distributed storage, software development tools, frameworks, and the like. Sounds like you have a lot on your plate. Today, our topic is engineering productivity. How would you define it for us? I guess I would define it as how effectively are your engineering teams able to get important and valuable work done? You know, so, I mean, how productive are they? Like, do they regularly seem to produce the kinds of results that you would expect a team to produce? Do those results seem to come slower than you would expect? That's sort of the high level thinking in my mind around productivity. Mm Mm-hmm. How do the best engineering teams measure their productivity? So definitely different people have more and less rigor around this. My personal approach is really all about goal setting and achievement of goals. So I think a productive team is regularly setting somewhat ambitious goals for themselves. And those goals can be around anything, right? They can be around building new features or new systems, but they could also be around stabilizing existing systems, cleaning up bugs, operability. There's a lot of different things that you could be setting goals on. It's not just about new stuff. But I think the way that I look at productivity is, are my teams setting somewhat aggressive, ambitious goals? And either hitting, you know, again, not all of them, but hitting a reasonable percentage of them, or missing them, but because we learned new information in the process. So missing them occasionally because we discovered that that thing we wanted to do is either a lot more work than we expected, or we did something and it actually wasn't nearly as effective as we wanted it to be. So the way I approach productivity is really from a goal setting and achievement perspective. I think that there are a lot of people that are a bit more rigorous about this in terms of things like how many features did a team get out the door or You know, they measure like story points or tickets or they have certain measurements that they kind of track over time, which I think you can do if you're very careful to make sure that people don't start to game those measurements. People don't start to inflate their estimates of things so that they can look like they're getting more done than they actually are getting done, which is why I personally prefer to go back to really what are we thinking about on the goal side and are we achieving our goals versus worrying so much about kind of the the details of 
story points or tickets or whatever. So that's kind of how I said it. The other way that you can think about productivity that I think is fairly helpful is almost in just like the basic, how often is our team able to make changes in production? If your team is able to, you know, make changes frequently, they tend to be more productive. And that's actually kind of a good first order approximation, I think. Mm -hmm. So you have highlighted some of the controversial sides of measuring productivity. What are some of the biggest challenges engineering managers face when it comes to their team's productivity? Oh, there are a lot of challenges. So I do think that one challenge that a lot of engineering managers struggle with is how to set goals in the first place and think about goal setting in a way that will be you know, inspiring to their team without either being, you know, a little bit on easy mode so you can say you got everything done or just too hard, um, which is can be demoralizing to people. I think that a lot of engineering managers don't think about how the processes and expectations around the way the work is done on their teams have a direct impact on productivity. So they don't think about the fact that if you have a ton of meetings, let's say, for example, right, um, and you make everyone to show up to every single one of those meetings, and they take a long time, you are dragging the team's productivity down, almost certainly. So I think sometimes managers don't really think about both how they how their actions in a active side, like having too many meetings drags productivity down, but also their actions in an inactive side. So some managers think that the way to create a productive team is just basically hire smart people and get out of their way. I have never in my entire career seen that work. That could work if you have extremely clear goals um, and extremely motivated people against those goals. There are times, I guess, when that would happen. I, most managers are not very good at setting extremely clear goals. Most businesses, it's just not that easy to find like super obvious, super clear goals. So when you're in a case where you're kind of always figuring out what you should be doing, you're always kind of adjusting your goals a little bit, expecting that you just hire smart people and get out of their way and they will magically be productive, I, I think is just pretty naive. I also think that most engineers don't learn how to be productive on a team necessarily um, without having experienced it at some point in their lives, right? So if you've never worked on a super productive team as an engineer, you're not going to know what that feels like and what some of the things you might be doing to make a productive team happen could or should look like. So I do think that engineering managers face the challenge of they need to they need to put some things in place, some policies or practices, depending on the team and depending on the goals and, and whatever in place to make the team productive. They need to be careful not to put too many things in place or they'll drag the team down. And they need to always be working on being as clear and crisp as possible about what the goals are and refining those goals with the team so that the team feels really motivated to be getting things done uh, against those goals. Mm -hmm. So you have mentioned a lot about um, how you measure it when it's an existing team, but how do you suggest to bring new hires up to speed to maximize their productivity? For new hires, one of the most important things is just that the more productive new hires are going to need to get a lot of context about what's going on around them, right? There's so much to learn when you join an established team with established technology. You've got to figure out how these systems work. You've got to figure out who all these people are. You've got to understand the problems that the team is solving. And, you know, smart new hires still need some help in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that some of the best ways to bring new hires up to speed are things like pair programming. I'm not a like pair programming zealot in that I don't think you should force everyone to pair program all the time. But I think pair programming is such a useful way to onboard a new person onto a team that you pair them with an experienced person um, so that they can watch how that person goes through the work and that person can describe the code bases as they're changing them um, and the approaches that they're taking the tools that they may be using to solve those problems. Not every company is just GitHub and like standard tools, right? Almost mm -hmm. everybody has some non-standard tools somewhere in their chain that they need to use for their software development process. So having someone paired with another person on the team for a little while, this doesn't need to be months and months, right? It could be as little as a few days or a couple of weeks, but having that process is, is a really good way to very quickly 
help new people get a lot of information and context about how things are done and the problems that are being solved on the team. And then, you know, I think the other thing is the clearer that you are, again, with what the goals of the team need to be and the goals that you're sort of working towards right now and the work that needs to be done, the easier it's going to be for new hires to figure out what to do. A lot of times it's hard for new hires to figure out what to do because you're not actually clear about what needs to be done. And you're just sort of hoping that the new hires will figure it out. And maybe if you're hiring someone that's very, very senior, that's appropriate. But, you know, if you're hiring someone kind of a normal programmer, right, coming in and they're a smart person, but you're not expecting them to change your life, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you need to give them uh, some context. You need to you need to give them some idea of what's important. How do they know what the important things are to work on? If you don't have a clear idea yourself, that's going to be really hard for them to figure out. And they're going to probably, you know, not necessarily end up working on the most important tasks if you're not personally clear yourself. Mm-hmm. It sounds like you have some onboarding or pair programming initiative with someone who is on the team. Is that correct? Yeah. And it's mostly the engineering manager's task to get the new hires productivity up to speed. That's certainly part of what engineering managers should be doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, is there any space for mentoring or coaching in this equation? So yes, absolutely. So I think part of what pairing can do, it's not the manager who's pairing with the new hire, right? It's some other engineer on the team. And a lot of what the pairing does also is like, create kind of a buddy system almost depending on who you pair with. So sometimes you might pair with a more senior person where you get not only like somebody who's teaching you the ropes, but also someone who potentially could be a mentor to you. Sometimes you might be pairing with somebody at the same level or even junior to the new hire who's really just there to like, they're going to show them the ropes and might be more of a buddy or sort of, sort of a, a friend who can answer questions about the company and help the new hire navigate things. I think mentoring can happen in a lot of different ways and it really depends on kind of your team and your company and the person. So people have a lot of different ideas, I think, when they talk about mentoring as to what it is. Mm -hmm. I sort of think of mentoring as uh, mentoring tends to be from more senior people to, to, you know, more junior people. And it's sort of like an advisory role, but mentors can be helpful if they're like really clued in and the company or the team or the projects and and they know how to tell a person what the most important stuff is. Mentors though, like a lot of times are just, you know, there to help someone navigate their career or help somebody learn like kind of a different skill. And so I think mentoring is not always like a a prerequisite for new hires. Mm -hmm. Um, Like you don't have to set every new hire up with a long-term mentor. I do think it's a good idea to set up a new hire with a buddy of Mm -hmm. some sort that will help them, especially for any kind of a bigger company that will help them get more established in the company. But depending on the seniority of the new hire, you may want to wait until you get to know the person a little bit better and their goals before you try to find someone to be their their quote unquote mentor. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, again, if you're talking about people who are just new to the industry for whatever reason, giving them mentors earlier is a lot, first of all, it's a lot easier because you probably got a lot more people who would be qualified to be a mentor in that case. And it's a bit more important because when you're first starting out in tech, there's a lot to learn about just like, how do you be an engineer and working in a company? And that's not something that you necessarily learn in college, even if you do like internships and things like that. But I think for a lot of people who are, you know, already have some experience it's better to wait a little bit and figure out what the right kind of mentor will be for a person than to assume that you always have to bring a mentor in from day one for every new hire. Mm-hmm. But again, a buddy on the team, somebody on the team who's you know committed to helping that person get up to speed on everything is, is a really great thing to have. Thank you. It sounds, sounds like it's really exciting to be, to be a new hire on your team. So how do you keep reports engaged and productive in the long run? Yeah. So keeping people sort of motivated and engaged is a really big challenge. And it's, I remember when I first started managing, I was like obsessed with the question of motivation. It just obsessed me. And I think it obsesses almost all new managers for for at least a while. It's just really, really hard to figure out how to do. So what I've learned, first of all, Again, coming back to what thing, something that I've said already, but I will say over and over and over again, 
you have to be clear about the goals of what you're doing. Um, people need to understand why they're doing what they're doing. They need to have some foundational appreciation for the fact that actually we are working for a reason. We have customers or whatever, right? We have these goals. These are why we have these goals. The more people understand why they're working on what they're working on, the more engaged they tend to be with the problems that they're solving. At a really senior level, you want to give people some kind of a sense of where you're going. And so I'm in sort of senior management now, and a, most of my time is spent thinking about the future and where we're going and making sure I'm explaining that and stating that and motivating that to the team as much as possible so that they mm -hmm. appreciate that we're not just like kind of working on a grab bag of things that happen to be important right now, but these things actually have some degree of coherence that we've thought through a little bit, why we're working on things, that we are going, we have these aggressive goals. The other reason, of course, that this is important at my level is that, you know, there are a million things to work on, right? So I have a team of almost 150 people. So it's a big organization, not huge, but big. And we own dozens of products um, within my company. So there are a lot of things we could be working on <laughs> at any given time. There are, you know, many, many, many choices about where people can spend their time. And for me to help the team be the most effective and so therefore the most productive, it's important for me to make sure that people know what the most important problems to solve are right now and that they are aligning the choices of what they're working on to the high level goals of the team. To give you like an example, let's say. Um, so imagine that you have uh, you know, imagine that you're working on a team like mine and you can have lots of different things that could be important. So you could be thinking about, let's say, making your tooling easier to operate and more stable. That could be a really important role. Let's say you, you have a big on-premise, you know, data center or footprint and you want to move to the cloud, right? That could be a goal. You could be saying, oh, we want to re, redo the architecture of this company and, you know, move from a more of a monolithic library driven architecture to a services architecture, right? Okay, so that could be a goal. These are the kinds of goals that teams like mine face. Now, you may actually have all of those goals to some extent, but it's very hard to actually have all of those goals be the most important thing. You can't have all of those goals be the most important thing. So it's important for me to be able to explain to the team, look, we do have lots of different things that we need to keep in mind and that we want to make forward progress on, but let's say of these three things, the most important thing for us is moving to a services architecture. You know, the cloud will happen, but we don't want to prioritize that right now. We care about key operational stability and we're going to make sure we have time to work on that, but we're not going to stop all work on features and new products to just stabilize what we have right now. However, if you have any project that is related to working on services, making the services architecture work, whatever that means for your team, that has to be in your top priorities. And that has to be something that you are putting more of your focus on versus the other things that we could be doing. So from my level, that's kind of what I'm doing all the time is helping the team through my reporting chain, but also through town halls and com communications with the groups and the way we do goal setting as an organization, just like helping the team really understand what is important. And I think that that helps a lot in keeping people productive, frankly. Like people will not be productive if they don't know what is important to work on. They might accidentally be productive, um, but I think it's pretty rare. I think it's pretty rare for people to like randomly kind of come up with the most important thing to work on. And you have to make choices, right? There's just so many different things that could be done that if you don't make choices and you don't kind of focus, you really end up with teams kind of going in all different directions and forward progress is a lot slower. So I do think that like engagement and productivity is just a lot about making it clear what people should be working on. So the other thing that I wanted to say is that you have to challenge people a little bit. Um, a lot of new managers f fall into a trap of believing that their job is to make their team like them and to be nice to people and make them feel happy at work all the time. And look, you should be kind to your team. <laughs> you should be, you know, like I, I don't, I would, please don't listen to this podcast and think, oh, I should be, you know, mean and abusive to my team and scream at them. And like, no, of course no, not, don't be right? Things. 
Right. Don't be that. That's that's a bad way to be. Um, and there are some managers who do that. That's also super bad. But I think some people think that their job is to be nice and to be everyone's friend and to make their team love them. You can do that. And in fact, I have seen this happen a, a few times where I've had managers where their teams love them. If you ask the team to give feedback or opinions on that manager, they get super positive feedback. But the teams are just not effective and they're not productive and they're actually not as engaged as you would expect a team who loves their manager to be. And they don't blame their manager, but in fact, it's likely, in my opinion, in my observation, that their manager is actually the person at fault for the team's lack of that engagement and productivity. So the manager has done everything they can to make the team love them. And they've been very nice and they have really let the team kind of do what they want. They've said yes to everything or they've kind of avoided giving any kind of negative feedback to people on the team, which means that the team feels loved by their manager. But as a result, when things are going wrong on the team, the manager isn't really there to actually like correct things, which sometimes the manager needs to do. Sometimes it is the manager's job to say, look, I know that you really want to work on this project and it sounds really cool to you, but it's just not the most important thing for us right now. Or, you know, sometimes it's the manager's job to say, I know that you think this sounds boring or tedious to improve the ability for us to release our software. But I promise you, if you spend a little bit of time working on this and we can actually release our software more frequently, you will feel more productive and happier. So I need you to trust me right now and do this thing that maybe you think is kind of boring or not cool or whatever, because the outcome is going to be better for all of us. And I think that a lot of managers really struggle to realize that it is not their job to be everyone's friend on the team. It is their job to make the team productive and engaged. And sometimes you make people productive and engaged by challenging them and by having kind of hard conversations or asking them to do things that make them uncomfortable, not uncomfortable again in an abusive way, but uncomfortable in a like, I don't totally know how to solve that problem. And it's scary for me to do that. Or a lot of people when faced with a problem that they don't know how to solve, they claim that that problem is boring or beneath them, or they drag their feet and they procrastinate. And I understand that I do that too, right? We're all human. But people get scared to tackle problems that they're not totally sure how to tackle. And it's the manager's job to, to push them and say, I know you're scared, or I, I know you might be uncomfortable with having to figure out this kind of problem. It's not the thing that you've that you're really familiar with and you're really fluent in, but this is the important problem for us to solve. And you're going to learn something in the process of doing this and the whole team will be better thanks to your contributions here. So I certainly think that, um, you know, if you want to keep your team engaged and productive in the long run, you can't just say yes to them all the time. You can't just be their best friend and buddy and, and be nice to everyone all the time. You actually have to push them a little bit. You are responsible for thinking about how you can improve the way the team is doing things. And sometimes you're going to have to ask them to do things. Some of them ask, ask some of them to do some things that maybe they are not as excited about for the greater sort of long-term health and good of the team. Wow, we have touched on a lot of key points here. What advice would you give to, to engineering managers to improve their team's productivity? So my go-to is how often is the team able to ship code to production mm -hmm. or whatever whatever production is for you, right? If you're running a normal, some kind of software engineering team that is producing some kind of tool, product, whatever, the more frequently your team can make changes and get those changes into whatever production is for the stage of the system that you're building, the more engaged they're going to be, the more productive they're going to be. This, I've never in my entire career seen this fail. I've seen it recently in one of my team's here, I've seen it at Rent the Runway, I've seen it in every job I've had, uh, pushing on an increased release cadence makes the team almost like immediately happier, right? Some, it does take some work to increase the release cadence. So, you know, my, my preference is at least once a week, once a day is even better. I've actually, I will admit, I've never really worked in a team where we've done the like literally every change goes into production thing. I think there's a lot of automation and stuff that you need around the product to make that work. If you've got the time to invest in that, 
do it. Tell me how it goes. But I certainly think that like if your team isn't able to release their software at least once a week, you are probably bogging them down. Somebody um, described this to me recently. She was describing a team that she had been working on that she was frustrated with. And she said, like, it just the team just feels constipated, which I thought was like a very vivid, uh, vivid description. But, you know, just everything feels stopped up because it was so hard for the team to release their software that people would build up all these changes. And then, you know, inevitably you do a release. And because you have so many changes, one of them breaks something. And then you've got to figure out what to do. You've got to scramble to fix that thing or do you roll back and then you build up even more and more and more changes before you can release. And there's a bunch of research on this, right? If you read the book Accelerate by Nicole Forsgren and others, it's a really useful book, I think, and just kind of laying out like, look, this is what we know about effective teams and the most sort of like productive high-end teams in terms of you know, building kind of good, reliable software and releasing frequently is really one of the most important things there. And I'm just, I'm a huge believer in, you know, so that's like my number one is like, get your teams to release more frequently than they are if they're not releasing that frequently. The other thing I would say is like, make sure people are talking to one another. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Again, you don't have to have a million meetings, but I've occasionally seen teams where it's like, oh yeah, we just canceled all of our standing meetings. We have no meetings anymore. Maybe that's okay if you've got a really good like ad hoc communication process, maybe, but it's good to talk to other people and make sure you are being really explicit in your understanding of problems and that you're actually all on the same page. When I advise managers, obviously I advise people to have regular one-on-ones. Regular one-on-ones are really important. One of the reasons regular one-on-ones are really important as a manager is that part of what we do is just, we have to be building trust with the people that work for us. And one of the important ways that people build trust is by having regular contact with another person and getting to know that person. And again, it's like, you don't want to build up things to talk about for too long, because if you build them up for too long, then you don't get through all of them. And the person feels like, It's just like building up other changes to your production code. And then like, oh, like there's a bug in the conversation. And now the conversation didn't get through all the important topics and it's not going to happen for another month or two months or whatever, right? Um, You want to have them frequently so you get through all the stuff um, and you don't have all those changes built up that that ultimately ends up in kind of like a trust decaying over time. Um, So make sure your people are talking to one another and, you know, you don't have to have a million meetings, right? Um, but you should be talking as a team probably at least once a week just to like make sure that you have this opportunity to cover valuable information, to share context about what's going on, to make sure you continue to all be aligned, um, that you're getting ideas in, out of the team. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, I think honestly, when it comes to productivity, and as I've said earlier, right, obviously, being clear about the goals is really important, but I, I've beat that dead horse. I, you know, mm-hmm. if, as long as you're clear about the goals, right, get them to release more frequently and make sure they're talking to one another. And I think those two things will help a lot on your productivity side. Thank you for joining us today, Camille. I'm sure and I hope that uh, a lot of our listeners um, could gather a lot of great insight. But if they want even more insight, how could they find you online? Sure. Well, I have a book called The Manager's Path. It was published by O'Reilly. So if you haven't read my book, you should check it out. It's been actually much more successful than I expected it to be when I wrote it. So I'm very proud of it. I tweet a lot, sometimes controversially. Um, My Twitter handle is at Scamil. I have a blog, alightedbranches.com. So that's E-L-I-D-E-D-B-R-A-N-C-H-E-S.com. And I don't blog that much these days because I'm very busy with work and other things. But I, you know, I post occasionally. I actually have a new, it's not a, not a book by me coming up, but a book that I edited um, called 97 Things uh, Every Engineering Manager Should Know, I believe is the, the title. This is another, O'Reilly has a collection of these 97 Things books. Mm-hmm. Um, and this one is about engineering management. And so I, we solicited essays from a whole bunch of people on engineering management. And so there are 97 of these essays, a few from me, a lot from other people. I forget how many contributors there are. There are like 40 or 50 or 
maybe even more. So it's, a, you know, lots of different people, lots of different perspectives. So if you're sort of interested in kind of a grab bag of perspectives on engineering management, um, that should be released very soon. I think we're finally in uh, printing it. So within the next month or so, that book will be will be out. But I think probably the easiest way to, to keep up with me, frankly, is Twitter. But if you hate Twitter, um, you can sort of keep an eye on my blog. But occasionally it will get updates. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us and for your insights. Today, our guest was Camille Fournier. She is currently the managing director at Two Sigma and author of a book and editor of a book. And as you could hear, she blogs and also tweets very often. So follow her online. Make sure that you can use some of her insights that she shared today. Thanks for joining us, Camille. Thank you for having me. I am Carolina Todt, and this was Level Up Engineering. I hope you had a good time with us, and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for staying with Level Up Engineering. If you enjoyed this podcast, so will your friends. Share this episode on your favorite social networking platform. To stay up to date with our content, follow Level Up Engineering on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Google Podcast. Brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications with Angular and Node.js. Check them out at codingsans.com. <laughs>